All right, so here's example two with concavity and points of inflection. So uh, the process is pretty much gonna be the same as in example one. Uh, we just have a different function here. So same instructions, different function. So uh, find the points of inflection of g of t equals t squared plus one over t. And uh, we also wanna know where is g of t concave up, where is it concave down? So again, it'll be just like in example one. So uh, just to outline the process real quick, we're gonna figure out uh, where's the second derivative zero, where is it undefined? Uh, use those values we get to break the real line into intervals, check the sign, S-I-G-N sign, of the second derivative in each interval, and then uh, where the second derivative is positive, that's where the function g of t is concave up. Where the second derivative is negative, that's where g of t is concave down. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, just real quick though, uh, let's point out the domain of this function here. So g of t equals t squared plus one over t. Uh, do we have any domain restrictions to worry about? Yeah, we do. Uh, t can't be zero, because here we're doing blah, 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 one divided by t. So we're not allowed to divide by zero, so that means t can't be zero. So that's our only domain restriction here, so let's write it down off to the side just for our own reference. Okay, so now let's go ahead and get started. So uh, g of t <coughs> equals t squared plus one over t. Now we're gonna take derivatives, so instead of one over t, let's go ahead and rewrite this, so t squared plus t to the negative first. So uh, I think we talked about this uh, in an earlier video a while ago, but you know, one over t, we can do quotient rule when we take the derivative, that's okay, it'll work, it's just kind of overkill, because uh, one over t is pretty simple, so we can rewrite it like this, t to the negative first power, and then do a power rule thing. So that'll be uh, a little bit easier. Uh, so, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, if you wanna do quotient rule instead, that's totally fine. Uh, nothing wrong with it, just a tiny bit more work uh, than you need to do. So g primed of t equals 2t, okay, if we take a derivative, that's 2t, plus t to the negative first, that's going to become uh, minus t to the negative second. Okay, so that's a power rule thing there, okay, just minus t to the negative second. Okay, so uh, remember the exponent comes down, just like it did over here, and then the uh, in, inside the exponent we subtract 1, so this became 2t to the first, this becomes negative t to the negative second. Okay, so now we want to get the second derivative. So g double prime of t equals uh, derivative of 2t is 2. And then this is minus negative 2, so that's plus 2. Okay, minus negative 2 means plus 2, t to the negative third. Okay, so let's go ahead and rewrite that as uh, 2 plus 2 over t cubed. Okay, so this is two times t to the negative third. So t to the negative third, that means uh, over t cubed like that. So two plus two over t cubed. So now let's go ahead and get a common denominator here. Do we have to do that? We don't really have to, but it, it's gonna make things easier. So uh, if we get a common denominator, multiply this by t cubed over t cubed. So then what we have is a two t cubed over t cubed plus two over t cubed still. Okay. So now we have a common denominator, so we can squish this into one fraction. So this is just uh, 2t cubed plus 2 all over t cubed, all right? So this is our second derivative, g double prime of t. Okay, so, um, you know, this might look a little more complicated than it really is, just because I, I showed more of the details than you might need to show or uh, see. But, um, you know, if you don't need to see all these details, uh, that's all right, it never really hurts to see them. Uh, and for those of you that do need to see these, hopefully they help. Uh, so anyway, here they are. Here's the second derivative, 2t cubed plus 2 all divided by t cubed. Now again, we want to know where's the second derivative 0, where is it undefined? Well, first of all, it's undefined when we're trying to divide by 0, okay? That's the only problem we, we could uh, potentially have here, is dividing by 0. So that happens if t is 0, but t is not allowed to be 0. Okay, that's uh, excluded because uh, it's not part of the domain of the original function. So even though uh, it makes the second derivative undefined, we have to toss it out anyway because the original function is not defined there. Okay, so we can just ignore that, so that's good. So now we just wanna know when is the second derivative zero, and the second derivative is zero uh, when this numerator is zero. <clears throat> okay, so the second derivative is this whole thing on top divided by that on bottom. So, uh, you know, numerator divided by denominator, that whole thing is zero when the numerator is zero. So all we have to do is take this guy on top, set it equal to zero, and then solve. So let's go ahead and do that up here where we have more room. 
So again, uh, a rational function, you know, this is an example of a rational function, this uh, second derivative here that's a rational function, it's zero when the top is zero. So 2t cubed plus two equals zero. So now we just want to solve for t. So first we can factor out a two. Okay, so now uh, really the two is just a common factor. We can divide everything by two, get rid of it, it's gone. So we just have t cubed plus one equals zero. Okay, so there's a few different ways to solve this. Uh, let's do this by factoring. Uh, so t cubed plus one, you know, one is the same thing as one cubed, right? So there's that formula for factoring uh, a cubed plus b cubed, uh, just in general. So we can apply that formula here. Uh, and if we want to do that, that's going to give us t plus one <coughs> times t squared minus t plus one equals zero. Okay, so if we factor this guy, we're gonna get this. So either this equals zero, or uh, t squared minus t plus one equals zero. Okay, so if t plus one is zero, then t is negative one. Okay, now t squared minus t plus one equals zero. Uh, this one, we're gonna have to use quadratic formula, but um, I'm gonna skip the details here and just say that uh, if we do the quadratic formula, we're gonna end up with two imaginary solutions. Okay, so these, uh, this does not give us any real solutions. So we can just toss it out, okay? So yeah, we can solve that and we'll get uh, imaginary numbers, but you know, it's gonna involve a high square root of negative one, things like that. But uh, we don't care about stuff like that for calculus. We only want the real solutions, okay? So the only real solution here is t equals negative one. So this is the only place where we have a possible point of inflection, okay? So what we wanna do then is uh, set up our sign chart, okay? So set up our sign chart, so let's use a different color here. Okay, so sign charts, uh, G double primed. Okay, always label your sign charts. Always label your sign charts. Got to be careful with that. Okay, so, uh, oh, and I just want to point out real quick. Um, when we solve this equation here, you know, you might not have to go through this much detail here, but uh, and there are a few other ways to solve this t cubed plus one equals zero. You can subtract one for both sides, take a cube root, but you got to be careful with that in general because you might miss some solutions. Now, in this case, that won't uh, matter because the other solutions we missed or that we would have missed, they're imaginary anyway. Uh, but in general, it's best to solve stuff like this by factoring if you can, and if you can't, uh, then there might be some other way to do it. Like here, we can't really factor this. We would have to do quadratic formula. Uh, but anyway, I just want to point that out. Um, you know, always solve things the best way possible, and you know, factoring is the way to go if you can. Um, anyway, just a little algebraic side note there. But anyway, uh, so negative one, that's our possible point of inflection. But let's also label zero, just so we're careful about that. So negative one, and then let's also label zero, because we have to exclude this from the domain. Okay, so we're gonna label that there. So we really have three intervals here, okay? From negative infinity to negative one, negative one to zero, and zero to infinity, okay? So, um, all right then. So we're just gonna pick one number from each interval, uh, and then test the second derivative Okay, we're going to see what's the sign of the second derivative, S-I-G-N sign, is it positive, is it negative, in each of these intervals here. So, uh, in this interval, let's pick negative 2. Uh, I guess that's a good number to pick. So, we'll get a different color here. So, uh, G double primed of negative 2 equals, uh, let's see. So, where's our G double primed of T? So, here, G double primed of T, that's uh, this whole thing right here. So, let me... Uh, box this whole thing here. So this is g double prime to t, this whole thing, okay, uh, the top and the bottom. So uh, g double prime to negative 2, you know what, let's maybe use a simpler version of this. Yeah, okay, so instead of using this, let's use this one up here. Okay, so this is also g double prime to t here, right? This. So let's uh, ignore this one down here. Let's use this one. It's going to be a little bit easier. So 2 plus 2 over t cubed. So g double prime of negative 2 is going to be 2 plus 2 over negative 2 cubed. Okay, and again, we don't care about the actual value, we just want to know is it positive or is it negative. So this is a 2 plus 2 over negative 2 cubed, that's negative 8. 2 plus 2 over negative 8, that's 2 minus 1 fourth. Okay, so this is a 2 minus 1 fourth which is uh, 7 fourths. 
Okay, which is positive. Okay. So the second derivative is positive in this entire interval here. Okay, positive in the entire interval there. So uh, now we want to know what about this interval here? So uh, now in this interval, sadly, it's bounded by negative one and zero, so we can't pick any integers. But let's pick a negative one half. Uh, probably the best thing we can do. So um, kind of out of room here. Let me uh, erase this. We don't really need that. Uh, all right, and let me move this over. So this will be equals uh, seven fourths greater than zero. Okay, so now we're going to pick negative one half in here from this interval. So g double primed of negative one half equals, uh, let's see. So we're going to use this two plus two over t cubed. So this is a two plus two over negative one half cubed. All right, and uh, this color is running out. Let's use something else. Okay, so uh, two plus two over. Now, if we take negative one half and cube it, we have negative a half times negative a half times negative a half. That's negative one eighth. Okay. Now, if you uh, so here we solve two plus so two plus. Now two divided by negative one eighth. If you divide by negative one eighth, you're really multiplying by negative eight. So this is two plus two times negative eight. Okay, again, dividing by negative one eighth is like multiplying by negative eight. So this is two minus 16, okay, which is negative 14, but we don't care what it is, we only care that it's negative, okay? So again, two minus 16 is negative 14, but who cares about the value? We just wanna know is it positive, is it negative? And it's negative. So, uh, I guess we'll use the blue here. Okay, negative. All right, now, um, that's actually it. We actually don't really have to check in this interval here. Uh, you know, if you want to, you can pick uh, the value t equals one, and then do two plus two over one cubed, and you'll get two plus two over one, which is four, which is positive. So you'll actually find that this is positive. But it doesn't matter. Um, why does that not matter? Well, you know, you might be thinking, oh, well, hey, the concavity changes from, or yeah, the concavity changes from concave down to concave up because the second derivative changes sign. But remember, zero. Uh, is not in the domain of the original function. So this can't be a point of inflection. Okay, this can't be a point of inflection here. So actually, I guess I should have been more careful earlier. Uh, for points of inflection, we're done, but we still need to see, is this concave up or is it concave down? Because that's part of the uh, original question we were asked. Where is it concave up? Where is it concave down? Um, so I guess, sorry about that. We do have to figure out, you know, is the second derivative positive or negative here uh, for the purpose of, you know, this part here for the concavity. But for point of inflection, uh, we have to be careful. This actually isn't going to give us anything new because the only possible point of inflection is negative one. Okay, and zero, um, you know, that's just a, a domain break. So there's no point of inflection here. Even though the concavity changes, this is not a point of inflection because it's not in the domain. So we got to be very careful about that. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, we know now where the function is concave up, where is it concave down. So remember, the function is concave up when the second derivative is positive. That happens at negative infinity, negative one, and zero to infinity. And the, uh, and the function is concave down when the second derivative is negative, which is from negative one to zero. So we'll write that down also, uh, but let's make a note of this point of inflection. So we also wanna know uh, that point of inflection. You know what, I guess also, since we did have to figure out the sign of the derivative of the second derivative in this interval, let's go ahead and just write that down. Uh, just to be thorough. So g, just to be thorough here, uh, g double primed of, so we picked one, okay, we picked one from this interval, so g double primed of one equals two plus two over one cubed. Okay, one cubed is one, two divided by one is two, so this is two plus two, which is four, which is positive, okay? So that's how we know that this is uh, positive here, all right? Okay, so, um, Let's erase this here, kind of out of room, but we don't really need this stuff anymore. And now let's figure out what that point of inflection is. So we know the corresponding x coordinate, or I guess t coordinate, we should say in this case, uh, it's negative one. So we wanna know what's the corresponding y coordinate. Um, and again, to find the corresponding y coordinate, uh, you always go back to the original function, always go back to the original function, because you're talking about 
point of inflection on the graph of the original function. So we know, you know, the t value in this case, we know where that happens. So to find the corresponding y value or the value of g, uh, we have to plug this t value back into the original function. Okay, so always, uh, you know, remember that, watch out for that. Okay, so when t is negative one, uh, what's happening here? Uh, g of negative one equals negative one squared plus one over negative one. Negative one squared is just uh, one. One divided by negative one is negative one. One minus one is zero, okay? So when t is negative one, the corresponding y coordinate is zero. So this corresponds to the point negative one comma zero, okay? So that's good, that's nice and simple, I guess. So uh, find the point of inflection of g of t equals t squared plus one over t. There's only one point of inflection. Uh, so the only, well, let's just say the POI is uh, negative one comma zero. Okay, so we only had one point of inflection in our last example too, but I want to point out you could have more than one. It is possible to have more than one. Okay? Or you might have none at all. Okay? So the point of inflection is uh, negative one comma zero. Okay, so that's one part of our answer. Uh, and again, uh, you know, it's okay for the y coordinate to be zero, but the x coordinate is not allowed to be zero. Okay, that's our domain restriction here. So that's why we know that there's no point of inflection here. There can't be one here because that's not in the domain right here. Okay. But we still had to check all three intervals to answer this other part. Where's the function concave up? Where's it concave down? So g of t uh, is concave up on uh, these intervals where the second derivative is positive, which is uh, negative infinity. Let me come down a little bit. Negative infinity to negative 1, and then comma uh, 0 to positive infinity. So you might be wondering, can we use a union instead of a comma? Yeah, that's okay. For increasing and decreasing functions, you want to be a little more careful and not use a union. So a comma is more acceptable in that case. Uh, some people might disagree, but um, I think I talked about that in an earlier video. But anyway, um, for concavity, uh, unions are fine, so we could use that, or commas. Um, it really depends on your instructor. You know, some might be more picky about that than others, uh, so make sure you uh, are aware of that. But I just want to point out that either way is fine, really. Um, it's normally how I would teach it, but uh, it just depends on where you are. So anyway, um, where is g of t concave down? That happens when the second derivative is negative, which we know is only in this tiny interval here. So g of t is concave down on negative one is zero. Okay, so that's the answer to the other part of the question. Okay, so point of inflection at negative one comma zero, the function is concave up on negative infinity to negative one, union or comma, zero to positive infinity, and uh, g of t is concave down on negative one to zero. So uh, be careful, you know, this is a point, negative one comma zero, x coordinate negative one or t coordinate and y coordinate zero. This is an interval, okay? Concave up, concave down, those are intervals. Point of inflection, that's an actual point. Coordinate, coordinate. Okay, but here, concave down from t equals negative one to t equals zero. That's uh, concavity on an interval. Point of inflection at an actual point with coordinates. So, you know, even though these look like the same thing, they're really not, okay? So that's a point, that's an interval. So watch out for that also. Um, Anyway, that's example two with concavity and points of inflection, uh, example three in the next video.